My name's Michelle Ufford. I lead the data management team at GoDaddy, which is basically focused on making the petabytes of data in our Hadoop data lake easy to discover, understand, and consume. So basically, once the data hits Hadoop, my team takes over. So before I get into the actual data warehousing portion, I want to give you a little bit of background, uh, because I think this is a little bit different. <laughs> Uh, I've actually spent the entirety of my professional career focused on the back end of data analytics, supporting everything from BI dashboarding all the way up to operationalizing predictive models and prescriptive analytics. As part of that, I have built a 34 terabyte data warehouse using SMP SQL Server on commodity hardware. I've also built a 100 terabyte MPP database, uh, data warehouse using Teradata. I've invested a significant portion of my professional career working with those data platforms, and more importantly, I've put a lot of my personal time, a lot of effort into those. And yet, today, here I am standing, talking to you about data warehousing in Hadoop. Why? Because at the heart of it, I'm a data person. I'm a data geek. I love what we can do with data. And the ability to co-locate all of your data in a single place is extremely powerful. So let me give you an example. GoDaddy's mission is to transform the global economy in favor of small businesses. We want to help them get online and be successful online. But we have a challenge, which is that small business owners might kick ass at what they do, but they're not necessarily very tech savvy. And we're a tech company offering tech solutions. So how can we help them? Well, we need to understand them. We need to know who they are, what it is that they need, so we know how to help them be successful. So let's look at a hypothetical customer dimension. You start off with your customer data. You have some attributes that are easily accessible or already available. Could be age, gender, geographical location. And you can augment this with your structured data. You can integrate them, and you can now see things like, what was the date of the first order or which revenue decile does this customer fall into. But your structured data is only 20% of the data that you have. At least it is for us. And if you integrate your semi-structured data, you create a much more full, richer view of this customer. I can look at my clickstream data, which for us is stored as JSON, and I can infer things, such as how technical is this person I can look at the browser, his, uh, the browser version and say somebody who has a browser that is very out of date is probably not very tech savvy. Or somebody who's connecting on multiple devices might be a little bit more tech savvy. I can also look at my social data, which is also often JSON, semi-structured data. And I can say things, I can find out things like, which social platforms are they using? How frequently do they post? What are they posting about? Is this person an influencer? And all of those attributes are super interesting in and of themselves, but they can also fuel our existing attribute of how technical somebody is. I can infer that somebody who is highly engaged in social media is also going to be a little bit more tech savvy. And then I can look at my unstructured data, in this example, product data. What product families do they own? What are they doing with those products? Again, these can become their own attributes, and I can again augment my view of how technical somebody is. Somebody who has installed Drupal is probably going to be a little bit more technical. So I am able to create new attributes, and I'm able to enrich the existing view of the existing attributes that I have. Hadoop is the only data platform that allows me to co-locate all of this data, to process that data, and to create a single integrated view a single, in this case, customer dimension. So that's why I'm here today talking to you about data warehousing and Hadoop. This is extremely powerful. Gartner defines analytics in four phases of ascendancy. The first one is descriptive analytics. This is what's currently happening, our traditional BI. This is reporting and dashboarding. And data warehousing has traditionally served this extremely well. It's also helped with diagnostic analytics. Why am I seeing this behavior? Why am I having this unexpected result? 
But this exact same data set, this customer dimension, can also become inputs into my predictive and prescriptive models. The attributes can either be features themselves or they can become inputs into features. If we do this right, we can create a single virtuous cycle of analytics where the same requests that we're getting from the business to create new attributes are fed into prescriptive analytics and the same features that we're defining in our prescriptive analytics are fueling reporting. Because guess what? That data scientist who has told the business, I just found a feature that is highly predictive for this particular outcome we're looking for, somebody in the business is going, you know what? I heard about that. I'd like to see some reporting about, around that. I'd like to measure that. It's all the same data, but historically, we've considered these silos. Each team has their own silo. They're creating their own view of it. Instead, since we have all this data co-located, we can create one set that fuels all of them. So today, I'm going to be talking to you briefly about GoDaddy's data platform architecture, some of the principles that have um, been behind the team and the project, the design patterns that we're using for data warehousing, and what our batch processing looks like. I'm also going to touch on some of the insights that we found as a result of this approach, and some tips and suggestions if after seeing this session you think this sounds like a good idea. Hadoop is at the center of our data platform. We do have a data lake. We have all of our corporate data, whether it's SQL Server, MySQL, Teradata, all of it's coming into Hadoop, tens of thousands of tables. We also have an ever-increasing amount of external data that's coming in that we want to use to either enrich our data or to augment it, or integrate with, rather. But then we have the other 79.7% of data in the company, which is the unstructured or semi-structured data. That is taking a different path into Hadoop. We are feeding that through a data collector into our feeds, our data feeds, which is then able to take two different paths. It can go through our real-time path if we want to do something with it, such as uh, use Spark on it. And everything that goes through this data collector goes into Hadoop. So we have all events, all sensors from all 34,000 of our hosting servers, all of our logs in one place. All of our data is co-located in Hadoop. So we do all of our batch processing there. But we don't serve it from there, right? We are serving, we are serving analytics, reporting, and applications. And we serve that out to whichever platform makes sense for that particular team and for their particular use cases. Data, visually, uh, data Viz sits on top of the serving platform, so we get faster uh, analytics, faster BI. And then our analysts use those tools, but then they also go to Hadoop directly via Hive to serve their ad hoc analysis. And then if we need to, we can also point those tools to Hadoop directly for uh, proof of concepts, prototyping, and one-off analysis. Given this, this architecture, given where we were going and where we are continuing to go, given that 79% of the data is unstructured or semi-structured, and given the volumes of data, it made far more sense for us to move our data warehouse to Hadoop than to process the data and move those large volumes to our data warehouse. So that's what we did. Before I get into exactly what we did, I do think it's important to talk about the principles that guide the team, because I don't think there is one size that fits all. And I think that these principles are a big part of why this works for us. So the first thing is that we want everything to be easy. It is very important to us that the data is easy, intuitive to consume, but also that the processes are easy. Because the easier the processes are, the more simple they are the easier it is to put quality automation around that and to automate portions of it that make sense. We also focus on value. So more than any uh, architectural or <laughs> data warehousing principles, it, we are more focused on delivering value to the business. And we do use Agile. We have weekly sprints. So we needed to have a process and a methodology that would support uh, quick delivery and rapid and repeated iterations. We needed to be able to iterate on the data and minimize the impact. That's probably the single biggest thing that's driven the decisions that we've made. And the last one is quality. Quality is paramount. You can build the most interesting data warehouse in the world, but if your data is incomplete, if it's missing rows, your data consumers will lose confidence, they'll stop using it, and they'll go back to the, the raw data. So uh, quality is built into everything from the ingress data processing in Hadoop, and then on the egress out to our serving platform. All right, so 
bottom line, guys, is we're doing a variation of Kimball. How many of you are familiar with Kimball methodologies? Okay, good. So we chose Kimball because it works pretty well with Hadoop, actually. There's only a few things that we had to change to make it work. Um, it works well for our data consumers. It's very intuitive for them to understand, and it works well with Agile. For those of you who are not familiar with Kimball, what it is is basically wide denormalized fact tables because that actually serves every type of analytics that I've worked with. I have never had anybody come back to me and say, yeah, Michelle, that table, it's a little too denormalized for me. Can you make it a little bit more normalized? Never, and this is the same data that's feeding applications, right? Because the applications just want to consume it, they just want it as an input. So the denormalized approach works very well with us. We also have very integrated dimensions. So we can integrate data in our fact tables, but most of the complex integrations take place in the dimension, such as the customer dimension that I, I um, walked through. We want to maintain data at the lowest level of granularity. But one thing that's slightly different here is for us, lowest granularity also includes transactions. So if you have inserts, updates, and deletes, we retain those. We write that data out to our fact and dimension tables in the transactional version. I'll show more on that pattern in a minute. And then we've got the data in the, the full fidelity. So we don't know how people want to use data. And we can try to cleanse the data or create something that is more useful for BI and reporting, but then maybe our data scientists want to see that raw original input. Maybe the application teams want to see that. We don't know. And I've frequently had people say, can I see the original data? So we don't try to guess. We always preserve the original, and then we have our augmented version of that. Some things that I think are a little bit different is we try to minimize dimensions. So I know I said Kimball. Kimball means dimensions, but if there's not a need for a dimension, we try to minimize it, especially flat dimensions, ones where you have some sort of code and some sort of description. Instead, we just embed the code and the description directly in the table that we produce. Why? Because it minimizes the needs for joins, and as we all know, joins are expensive in Hadoop. It also makes it easier for people that are not very data savvy to be able to use the data. We try to minimize the need for updates because if you have a request that comes in for the age of a customer, or maybe they want to know how many days since their last order or days since last X event, uh, we would automatically have to update that every time. So instead, anytime we have some sort of time decay, we try to go back to the actual date. And then we don't have to do any complex logic because of the approach we're taking with the transactional data. We automatically will get that updated the next time that transaction comes in. It's, it's free for us. We don't have to worry about it. And then lastly, we use natural keys and not surrogate keys for two reasons. One, surrogate keys are difficult to generate in Hadoop. Secondly, when you compare the data that we create to the tens of thousands of tables that exist in Hadoop, there's no way we're going to touch all those tables, and there's no way all of them are going to make their way into these enterprise data sets. We know that, and we don't want to be a barrier to people using this data. We want them to take our data and join it to their raw data, to their product data. So by preserving the natural keys, we're enabling greater use and um, joins with that data. So there are two primary patterns for data uh, in, in our enterprise data layer. The first one is the transactional. This is any data coming in from SQL Server or MySQL, where we have inserts, updates, deletes. What we want to do is, again, as I mentioned, preserve that, right? So we have on the left, you have the ETL timestamp, which is just simply the date that we inserted the record. We have the source transaction, and this is just a snippet of it. There's actually more information. But this is very useful for us in understanding where did this data come from for quality perspectives, for debugging. And then we have a logical delete flag, because if that if that transaction was a delete, we need to know that for the next part of this process, which is going to be snapshotting. So we have these three columns on the left. Then we have our natural key. This can be a composite natural key, depending on what your data is. And then after that, it's just all the attributes. Hopefully, this looks pretty familiar. Does this look familiar? Yeah, good. But that other table, that works great for our data scientists. They want that level of detail. They want to see change over time. Our financial guys and our SOX guys love that table. 
because they can say, go back to this point in time, down to this millisecond, and to this other time, this other millisecond, and show me what's changed, because I need to understand that. So they love that other table. But most people don't want to see that level of detail. It's difficult. You'd have to roll up all those transactions. Most people want to see the same granularity in your factor dimension table that they would expect to see on their production systems. So what we do is we snapshot that data. We create an automated process that builds off the transaction table. It rolls up the transactions, and it gives you one row for every natural key. And this is what most people use for querying. Does that make sense? So there are a few other differences between it. The transactional table is what is created by the data engineer. So they create a pig script, and this is the output of it. Uh, it is optimized for ETL processing. We want ETL to be as simple as possible so we can put quality around it and so we can automate it and so it's self-healing, not if, but when there are failures. <laughs> then we have the snapshot table. The snapshot table is completely automated. We, we obfuscate the complexity of it by just understanding what the structure of that should be and by having the consistency of the way we write the data out. Uh, this is the table that, as I mentioned, is optimized for querying. Then we have the other 79.7% .7 of our data that we have to deal with, the non-transactional data. This is actually very simple for us. Uh, because we don't have to deal with the concept of transactions, you have just a row. Uh, events are a great example. You cannot unclick something after you clicked on it. There is no concept of updating or deleting that or deleting the fact that you made a call. So when we look at user events, it's just one row for each action. We have the ETL timestamp, um, and then we just have whatever information is available to us. So if this is JSON in this example, we would parse it out. We would do any sort of data enrichment, any sort of integrations that make sense. And then, as I mentioned, we always preserve data in full fidelity. So we actually have the original JSON. Why? Because things change. And somebody could add another key that we're not aware of, and we don't want to prevent people from being able to use that. In fact, this has happened numerous times where the application team has made a change to the JSON. And because of this design, people can still query it and get what they need without having to involve us. We're not a roadblock. So how do we do this then? We've got the design. We know what it is we're trying to build, how do we actually build it? Well, we have, as in most enterprise data warehouses, a concept of three logical layers. We have the data coming into Hadoop, goes into our raw ingress layer. I say raw, it just means that we haven't touched it in Hadoop. It could still be a, a very fine state uh, or view of the data, but we have the ingress layer where the data comes into Hadoop. Everything in green is mostly or completely automated. Then we have our enterprise data layer. Everything in orange is something that a data engineer or analyst had to go create. So here we have those two views I just showed you on the data. And then we've got our data consumption layer, which is where we do data presentation. We want to integrate, we want to aggregate, or we might want to prepare it because we want to load it out to Cassandra and it requires a different format. So we do all that here. This is a logical construct that the data management team uses. We do not prevent people from going from the ingress layer directly to the data consumption layer, or from joining across all three of these layers. There's no limitations in place. We don't want to be a barrier to people using the data. This is just how we like to think of the data for the processing that we build. Then we have the actual execution of the batch. So as I mentioned, we want things to be easy. We want to try to automate as much as we can. We want to ensure quality. And so this is what we built. We have a process that checks to see the next transaction time. Everything in the ingress layer is partitioned. This is a, a to clarify, this is a transactional example. So everything on the transactional data in the ingress layer is partitioned by transaction date, and depending on the table, transaction hour. So it becomes very easy for us to persist that in the data management layer. And we just look to see what new transactions have occurred since the last time we ran this. Because maybe there was no available resources the last time we tried to run this, it failed. Now it's going to be self-healing because we can just automatically pick up where we last left off. 
So we are going to identify that there is indeed data available for us to run. Then we're going to go prep the destination servers. And this is a zero to end design. So we could not move the data outside of Hadoop, or we can move it to MySQL and SQL Server and Cassandra, and maybe multiple copies, depending on if it's a data set that a lot of people are interested in. So we prep that, which basically means we truncate a stage table. Then we load our pig script. And the pig script is going to filter by the transaction date, which is just a variable that we pass to it, a perimeter. And we do all the transformations and integrations that you would expect. And then we write the data out to our enterprise data layer with the same partitioning scheme that we have on our ingress layer. They match, because this is optimized for ETL. And because this is a data pipeline, we look for the opportunity to try to build any other views of the data that are related. So we've got new customers. And new customers is very obviously an easy aggregation of your customer data. Which ones have been inserted? That's going to go to my new customer. So here is that data at the same time. And now I store the data directly from this process to my destination servers. But quality is paramount, and <laughs> jobs can and will fail in the movement of data from Hadoop to the destination servers for all sorts of reasons. So before we merge that, we want to ensure did the data get there, and is it complete? Do we have the same number of bytes or rows that we wrote to HDFS matching the destination server? And if it does, everything's great. We execute the merge process, and now our destination table is updated. Um, if not, there's going to be an alert, and somebody's going to go take a look. And then we have our uh, snapshot that gets refreshed, because we've now updated our, our data. So that's it. <laughs> OK, so I won't pretend that everything has been easy to get to this point. There have certainly been challenges along the way. However, looking at where we are today and what it's enabled for us, I absolutely believe that it was the right decision for us to, to do this. We have found that it is a much better use of our data engineers. Before, our data engineers spent the majority of their time moving data from point A to point B and troubleshooting failures with that, or troubleshooting failures with the process. It was very slow. Now, they're able to focus primarily on doing something with the data. So we have this very intelligent set of resources that are able to use their brains and do something, which is great. It's also very, suit, very well suited for Agile, because as I mentioned, we want to be able to roll something out in a week. And we don't always know what's the best design going to be or what are the best rules. And honestly, guys, I've been doing this a long time. I might not even know the right rules or the right design after two or three months, right? So the best thing to do is to put something out there and let people start using it and then iterate on it because they're probably not going to tell you that there's a problem until they actually use it. So we design for this. But because we have all the data in the raw ingress layer, it becomes trivial for us to make changes and just roll forward with them. And we minimize the impact to our data consumers by creating that abstraction layer. So we are free, for the most part, to do what we want to do in Hadoop to create these better integrations and to refine the rules that we have. Data integration is huge. 79.7%. <laughs> this was enlightening to me. I'm a, a relational data person, and we have a lot of relational data. And I knew we had other data, but I didn't realize quite how much or quite how valuable it was. And I've tried to work with that other data because we knew sometimes there were little nuggets that we needed to pull into our predictive models. And it was extremely painful. It is so much easier to integrate that data with this type of approach. And then lastly, we have one place now for all of our data processing. So before, I mentioned all those little silos of analytics where you've got different uh, phases of analytics. And then even within those phases, you'll often have different teams of analytics, each with their own little data silo where they're reproducing the same basic result. Now we've got one place for all of that. And we're able to put the enterprise resources around quality and monitoring and ensuring that we have robust production processes. It's enabled the data that we create to have far greater reach. So before in our data warehouse, we would have one or two teams. And I say teams. I mean, there could be a lot of people within BI or you know, one of our data science teams. But still, it's limited to a handful of teams that is looking at that data, that's consuming the data. 
And there were other people that were interested in it, but it was always difficult to either integrate their data with us or get our data over to them. Now we've got all the data in one place, and they don't have to worry about pulling their data in because it's already there. Now they can just do the joins. So we found that we've been able to take the same data set and enable each phase of analytics and uh, enable lots of application teams. The other thing is that it's not just these phases of analytics. It's not people that have roles for each one of these. It's not somebody who's an analyst or a data scientist. We've had individual engineers, just people that are curious, that go look at the data and they draw some really amazing insights. And we're seeing this time and time again. In fact, some of the greatest insights are coming from those guys and we're enabling them to be able to do that. Uh, as far as the actual processing goes, the descriptive and diagnostic analytics are the groups that primarily use snapshots. We have the predictive analytics, as I mentioned, it uses the transactional so they can see change over time. And then the prescriptive analytics uses the combination of both depending on what it is that they're trying to do. So often they'll take the snapshot maybe of the customer dimension and ship it over uh, to where they're doing their stream learning for like a Lambda architecture. So some of the things that we have seen as a result is a increased ability to do churn analysis. This is something I keep hearing at this conference, churn analysis. And we have churn analysis from different angles and different products and different ways of looking at it. And we've just seen that there's been a lot more capabilities by having this here. We had one particular guy who was able to look at the enterprise data that we produced, the product data that, was, that he was familiar with, and the event data, which he was less familiar with, but he was able to consume. And he was able to draw an insight that for this particular segment of customers, we're creating a really negative experience because they have different expectations than what we're serving. And so they were able to take it back to their product teams and measure the impact and satisfaction for that group of uh, customers. New attributes, we're finding the ability to create all types of new attributes. I mentioned just some of this with the different types of data that we have available. It's also about being able to bring in external data and easily integrate that. Um, and, and oftentimes it's not just new attributes, but it's more accurate attributes. So we have gender, which is very useful for understanding behaviors. It's not usually populated by our customer, right? So we can infer things like the, the gender of a person given their first name and downloading some data from the US Census, right? And then it gives us the probability of being male or female from that. And so we can say, well, if you provided your gender, we're gonna take that, but if not, we're gonna put this, this in as a suggested value. So we have a much more complete view uh, of gender as a result. So this has been very uh, valuable for us. Sentiment analysis is one of the canonical examples or use cases for Hadoop. Everybody talks about social analysis, but it's not just social, it's any kind of uh, sentiment analysis or text analysis. So you can do this on your call transcripts, your chats, your emails, um, and then obviously your social as well. And there's a lot of value in this because you're able to take that and you're able to understand how does my customer feel about this or this particular product. And that creates the opportunity to improve that experience. You can see, well, maybe we can design this differently or maybe this customer is unhappy because they purchased the wrong product. So let's go reach out to them and get them in the right product. It's very powerful for us. And then customer dashboard. So this is actually something I really love. We had a guy just playing around uh, on the website builder team that was looking in Hadoop and saw that the customer's, um, the customer's website traffic was there. And so he processed the data in Hadoop, shipped it over to Cassandra, and we created a dashboard. And I think it only took them, it took them a very little amount of time. It was relatively trivial for the amount of value that we got from it. So this just became another free benefit to the customer as a result of us being able to use this platform. And these are just a handful of examples. I have so many, um, but I like those ones. So here are some tips and lessons learned, some things that I have found from my own experiences. The first is that this isn't that new or that different. You see, there are some things we have to think about, such as the immutable data or immutable nature of Hadoop or how to work with things. Um, but if you worked with MPP, a lot of the same paradigms are already in play you're already gonna be somewhat familiar with the concepts of MPP. And if you haven't worked with MPP before, but you have worked with Data Warehouse, you can see it's pretty similar. Uh, so just focus on that. We don't have to reinvent the wheel just because it's big data. <laughs> the other thing is to try to standardize on a technology early on. I did make the mistake of saying, oh, let's let the engineers pick which language they wanna use because why not? 
And uh, that was not a good decision. <laughs> we ended up with a lot of Hive because uh, they're very familiar with SQL. And then that was great because they were able to quickly deliver things, but then it becomes difficult to maintain and ensure the quality of it. And then you also have to store the data. It's a lot easier to write a source statement in Pig than it is to do a scoop job for everything. So we, uh, we just standardized on Pig for ETL and then Hive for analysis, or Hive for quick prototyping, proof of concepts, one-off, that kind of thing. We focused incessantly on simplicity, simplicity and, and we still do this. When we look at a design, we always say, how easy is this gonna be for somebody to intuitively understand what this means, and how easy is it gonna be for them to query? And that's always the first question we ask. Um, if it's not easy, you fail, because ultimately what we're trying to do when we look at these data warehouses or analytics is enable people to consume the data. So always keep that in mind. It's not about your processing, it's not about your methodology, it's about being able to consume that, that data. Uh, conversely, though, I'm gonna say don't be afraid of complex data types. There are times where the easiest way to design something is instead of having a parent-child relationship to just simply create an array and embed that directly in there. So your data consumers do have to get familiar with being able to work with arrays and structs, uh, but it's a much simpler design, and once they do it once or twice, it, it becomes pretty easy. So think about that and just ask yourself, I mean, look at the data, right? Uh, what makes the most sense? I'm not saying always do that, and I'm not saying to create complex structures of nested arrays or structs, don't do that. It won't be easy to work with. <laughs> um, be predictable, right? People like consistency. So settle on a naming convention early on, make them intuitive, easy to understand, avoid abbreviations, especially as you work with you know, global or, or people from other countries. Abbreviations are difficult to understand necessarily. Uh, you also, like with us, we have all of our data sitting in DM underscore databases. So anybody that goes to consume data in Hadoop can easily find what we consider to be the enterprise data sets, and they can go consume those and then integrate them. So uh, be consistent, expose all your data through H catalog, and um, settle on a naming standard. And then don't be afraid of change, as I mentioned. That's, that's the point. Everything's changing so quickly, right? We wanna be able to embrace that change and then just create some abstraction layers that minimize the changes for your data consumers until they're ready to work with the new value that you've provided. You know, here's the new view of that. Now wait until you go update your report design so you can consume that data. Um, but then you're not held back that way. You can still create that and everybody else who's interested in that data can see the new view. Uh, do quick prototyping. I, I've had many moments in Hadoop where I've gotten really excited, but the very first one was when I was looking at JSON data and I had a structured table and I was able to join it to a JSON file without doing any ETL. It was mind boggling. I created this external table and I just used a JSON function and I was blown away by the fact that I was able to create this analysis with no ETL, no, no transformations. I didn't have to create a copy of the data. This is a very powerful feature and I think it's something that we need to make sure that we are telling people is available to them because people walk in the door with this mindset from other systems that, oh, you have to transform the data first before you can join to it. You don't have to. If you're doing prototyping or ad hoc analysis or a one-off, don't do ETL. It's not worth it. Now, once you get to the point where you want to productionalize it, then yeah, you probably want to do the ETL so you can get better performance and, and other things, but uh, just keep in mind those functionalities. And then democratize data and the data processing. We have had some of the most incredible insights come from, as I mentioned, individual contributors. People who had no business be lo being looking at the data. All they cared about was improving their product and they were able to do that through the data. The data was the tool for them. So I would, I would ask that you consider not just your analyst and your data scientist, but consider the entire pool of people that are potentially interested in your data. And then don't stop at the data, right? We tend to think of data as the final deliverable. Here's my fact table, here's my dimension table, but it's not really. It's really what you're doing with the data. So do yourself a favor, take a step back and think about things end to end. Am I enabling this? application to consume this data? Am I enabling this report to consume this data? And you'll find, look, taking that view, you'll find all the uh, roadblocks that you are not aware were there for your data consumers. So that is my session. Hopefully that was helpful. If you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm uh, curious how, uh, when you have such a diverse data set in your data lake, 
how do you do the correlation? For example, let's say you have a, you know, you have a stream of data that comes from social media and something else from click, you know, click, uh, click through streams. And then how do you correlate that to the structured data that comes from relational databases? Just some insights on, you know, what the algorithm was without revealing the secret sauce. Uh, good question. So how do we correlate our external data with the structured data that we have? Uh, that's part of our job is to figure out that integration, right? So typically it's going to be on an email address. And so we try to figure out how to get to that relationship. Uh, we do everything on hashing so to pr preserve um, privacy. So we would hash, hash the external data as it comes in. And then that's typically the join pattern for most of what we do. There are some other ways that we look at the data, but that's probably the biggest. Yeah. Yes. Um, one of the, um, I understood pretty much, uh, you know, you're completely putting everything in the fact table, the IDs and the description, uh, no surrogate keys. The challenge is, uh, you know, that makes total sense, but are you using the data warehouse to power data maths about which they would do the reporting? I understand the data scientists, they are, you know, they are uh, good, uh, who are capable of writing codes, they are comfortable going into the um, Hadoop and directly doing their hive or whatever. But for the general reporting audience, um, they like reporting tools, uh, one of the established reporting tools. So how successful were you guys were able to have whatever, uh, you know, any large enterprise like yours will have many reporting tools. Uh, so were you guys trying to also have those tools directly work on your Hadoop data warehouse? Or you said Hadoop data warehouse is for like Hive data scientists. If you need really that kind of reporting, then we'll put it into Data Mart and you do the reporting from there. Good question. What we've done with our data viz actually is to try to cut down on all of the different toys, uh, tools that we have, right? Because we just found it was too much to be able to manage and uh, to be able to get to the place that we wanted to get to. For most of the production reports, we will do the integration or the aggregations in Hadoop prior to sending it over, so a data mart. You know, we'll create a data mart in Hadoop in that data presentation layer, and then that's what gets shipped over to the um, serving platform. The other thing, though, is there's a lot of requests for being able to drill down. So what we will do is take a subset of the data and export that directly so that people can do discovery. Or if it's, um, you know, like a dimension table, they'll get the full raw set. And then that way they can do whatever types of analysis that they're interested in. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense, but is your broader reporting users uh, use go to the data mart today or uh, the Hadoop? So if it's a technical, per, I mean, if it's an analyst, a data analyst, then they can use either Tableau, Google Analytics, Excel, or um, then they'll also use Hive directly. If it's a business user, they're typically, typically going to use something like Tableau or Google Analytics, and they're not going to go to Hadoop. But what we are doing, we're in the process of enabling, is uh, having people be able to request copies of the data. So we have an OpenStack instance where people can stand up, um, you know, clusters of, you know, compute nodes. We can ship the data over there for them, let them point Tableau there, and then they can drill down however they want. And when they're done, we'll just tear it down. Mm -hmm. uh, what, are you uh, storing files in, in what f formats in your data lake? We are storing the data in, in our data, enterprise data layer yeah. is uh, stored as ORC files. Okay. And um, have you, where are you with, you know, the variety of sort of SQL on Hadoop engines and kind of that whole world? We primarily use Hive. Just for plain old Hive? Plain old Hive. Well, I mean, we, we have uh, Tez. We also use Spark. Right. So we have that capabilities there. But for the most part, most people that are trying to do just basic uh, analytics are trying, Hive works well for them. Anybody who has more complex analysis is either using Pig or Spark or Python. I got a quick question over here. Uh, on your previous slide, one of the last things you mentioned was abstracting things. Mm -hmm. um, I think you were, it was like the. Uh, oh, don't be afraid to change. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So can you detail that a bit more? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of fuzzy as what mechanism you're using for abstraction or what, what, okay. what do you mean by that? Great question. So when I say data abstraction, there's really two different approaches. One is when we, export the data to our serving layer. We do that for our data consumers. And 
it's actually beneficial because now we know there are consumers of this data, who they are and what they're doing with it. You mean and like when you put it into like a relational database, is that what you mean? Yes. Or? Okay. Yeah, so All MySQL, right. SQL Server, or it could be Cassandra. Um, but we have that data, we're storing that for them. So we know that that, that relationship exists. So when, when we make changes, we can modify the export of that particular, um, for that particular destination to look like just what it looked like before. So we'll do those transformations to minimize it, and then when they tell us they're ready for the new functionality, we'll, we'll update that. For people using the data in Hadoop, we can create virtual views where we will do the transformations and try to emulate. Um, we haven't ran into a situation yet where this hasn't been able to, to work. Uh, so it's, it's worked well for the needs of abstracting for the analysis in Hadoop and then for the serving outside of Hadoop. And, and so when you say virtual views, are you talking about just writing like a pig job or something to create a new version of the data, or is this like a? I know, it's a oh, I high view. I haven't heard of yeah. it. Okay, sorry. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, <clears throat> earlier you mentioned that you have some kind of a reporting set of reporting tables that mm -hmm. reflect what the data looks like in the source system. Mm -hmm. right. So uh, since data is changing all the time in the source system, then you obviously have to reflect these changes in the, the Hive tables. Mm -hmm. How do you, what method do you use to make those updates? All of our Hive tables are really just external tables pointing to the transactional data that we import. The transactional data is coming into our system. There's like a um, threshold, so I think it's either every 100,000 rows or a million rows will import it, or at the, at the latest it'll be every 10 minutes we get the data in. And the snapshotting is happening on a daily basis for the ingress layer. So what we do for people that need the data at a lower latency, we create a virtual view that concatenates the transactions with the snapshot view. Every subsequent hour, it will get slower, but it provides enough functionality. And then if there's an application need where they need to have the hourly view or lower latency for, with faster performance, then we'll just snapshot that more frequently. So you're not actually physically updating that record in the, the Hive table? Then, no, it's a, a append only a, to the transactional table. Append only. And then the, it's the snapshot where we roll that up. Hmm. So it, the Hive for us is purely uh, external tables pointing to the data on HDFS. Okay. When we create the snapshot, it's rolling it up by natural key, so it automatically, you get the dedupe. You get the, the most recent view of that transaction, or that natural key, rather. Since it seems you're uh, compressing all your dimensions into a single table that you snapshot against your transactional data that is your fact table, is that? Uh, that's only if they're flat dimensions, only if it's like a descriptor with a code will do that. Okay. So and we can still create those dimensions, like if we need it for visualization, we'll create them, but you don't need to join to them, so it is faster performance in Hadoop. Okay. Um, thank you. And a fantastic session. <laughs> thank you. Very similar question. Um, just anything that you'd have to speak on normalization versus denormalization. Uh, I'm having many small, slowly changing dimensions related to transactional data. Uh, so for slowly changing dimensions, we basically are using a type four, which is just a historical table, which works well with the, the paradigm. So it's difficult to do something like a slowly changing dimension type two. So we don't do it. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other part of your question? Uh, it's really just on denormalization. Normalization. Denormalization. Yeah. So we, we denormalize, basically. Okay, so you're um, just bringing the dimensional data along with the, the rows? No, we, we will create dimensions. If there's a hierarchy especially, we'll create a dimension and we'll, we'll retain that. And we just find that the ones that actually have hierarchies are uh, much less than just the potential for very flat dimensions. And we will create those tables there for reporting, but they're just not required. It's all embedded in there to make it easier to consume. Thank you. Sure. I heard that you have a background of Teradata, and so I was wondering <clears throat> how do you approach the same uh, distribution ideas in Hadoop versus like in a Teradata, and what were your learnings that you brought from there and applied here? What were the learnings we brought from our Teradata data warehouse to here? Um, mostly around distribution. Around distribution? Distribution like the Hadoop? Like data distribution. Data distribution. Uh, what we, I guess one of the learnings that we have was just that <sighs> We want everything to be automatic. We don't want to have an engineer have to do the ingress and the egress because that's where in Teradata we spent the majority of our time. So we actually spent a lot less time on doing the transformations 
inside of Teradata. That might be us in our implementation, but we learned from that, and so we created a methodology that would make it very easy. Um, even in Teradata, we found that you know, Teradata was not always the final destination. We wanted to consume that from applications, so we made sure to consider the applications up front in this design. And I think I need to go. Last question. Okay. Uh, I have a question about concurrency. How many users are hitting the Hadoop layer directly, and have you seen any bottlenecks around that? Great question. How many users are, are hitting Hadoop directly? I actually don't know the answer. Um, I can tell you that I've created a data platform virtual user group, and we've got <coughs> 70 members on that, and that growth has all been organic, where people have been coming to us saying we wanted to use Hadoop. Um, but I think the number of actual users is probably higher than that. I don't have the actual number, but I could probably get it for you. Um, I will be happy to take questions at the back of the room for anybody else that didn't have time. Thank you so much. Thank you.